We're going to try the uh, overhead projector again. And I don't know if you remember last time that I was talking, but it disconnected several times. So all I can tell you is if it disconnects more than once, we have a little backup plan up there, but the Adkins is going to draw stick figures on the screen for us and shoot them across. So <clears throat> Now we have a backup for it. Thank Brother Heinrich. So if it does switch to Apple TV, it will no longer have Tarzan of the Apes across the screen. It'll just be a console you can see. But let's ask the Lord's blessings upon today. We're talking about the Holy Ghost, something I too frequently take for granted. I'm sure you do the same thing as we go through the lesson today and recognize the extent that God went to so that he wasn't an external force, but he was coming to live inside of us. Let's go ahead and ask God's anointing upon us as we study his word today. Jesus, I thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for allowing us to be your children, to grow up, to become the children of God. I ask your anointing upon us as we study your word specifically about the Holy Ghost today. Thank you for this gift that you've given us, for the change that you've made in our lives. We worship you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you. Well, originally Pentecost was a Jewish holiday. It was held 50 days after Passover, and agriculturally, it commemorates the time when the first fruits of the harvest was brought into the temple. So that period from Passover to Pentecost was a great time of anticipation for Jewish folks. They had three holidays that came pretty close together, and it, it was a festive time of year. Christianity, on the other hand, celebrates Pentecost Sunday as the birthday of the church. Because after Jesus told his disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father which turned out to be the gift of the Holy Ghost. It was on the day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples in the upper room, causing them to speak in other tongues. And this is, of course, documented in Acts chapter 2. And throughout today's lesson, I'll use the phrase, the gift of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit interchangeably, because it's the exact same thing we're talking about. It's the Spirit of God that he's chosen to work through to live inside of us. So our focus thought today is that receiving the Holy Ghost as an essential part of salvation. Because the Holy Ghost, it regenerates believers through the new birth experience. It enlightens, it energizes, it encourages us in our new life with Christ. So your notes show the outline for the study, and I've left you some space on them to jot down scriptures and thoughts of your own as we work through it. Our lesson text comes from Acts chapter 1 and verse 11, and it is... Uh, it is a lot of information in a small little package. And it looks like I'm going to have to read it to you because that's pretty tiny. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after that through the Holy Ghost had given commandment unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. And that's going to be the crux of today. There is a promise that God made to his children. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. I've mentioned this before, but it always amazes me when you start studying the scripture, how succinct the word of God is. Just 11 verses, and think of all the phenomenal things that happened in this, what, three-minute reading of the word of God. First, there's the promise of the Father. Now, whenever my father makes me a promise, that means something good's going to be happening. My dad's not going to promise me, hey, I'm going to give you a whooping. Now, sometimes that was a promise, like during church when I was acting up as a kid. But normally, a promise is associated with something good is coming. Secondly, there was the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The first time this has been talked about, they didn't even understand it fully. Then there's going to be power to be witnesses, not just to this little Jewish area, but he said to the whole earth. Amazing things talked about here in just 11 verses. 
Then, as if that isn't enough, Jesus defies gravity, and he just starts lifting up like smoke right in front of them. That's a little different. And then, as those two are, as Jesus is going out of their sight, there's two smart aleck angels who show up. <laughs> because they're saying, why are you looking up there? Really? I just saw Jesus ascend up here. I'm still wondering if he's going to come tumbling out of the clouds. What's going on? We've never seen this before. Or maybe they were just so used to following orders, Jesus said, you go to Jerusalem. Why are you still staying here, man? Get going. Either way, the disciples, maybe feeling sorry for their quandary, decided to give them a little insight into the second coming of Christ. You know what? That was so cool how Jesus just went up. I'm going to give you a little tidbit, disciples. Jesus thinks it's cool too. Matter of fact, whenever he comes back, he's coming back the exact same way. So I may have that wrong, but that's what I'm reading into the scriptures there. So our focus verse, though, is Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Wait for that promise. Something big is about to happen. Something monumental is going to change on earth. And really, I can't overemphasize that. It's going to be hard for us to comprehend it, hard for them to comprehend the magnitude of the change that God implemented with the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's something that he wanted all along was that fellowship with mankind. But finally, he determined this is the way that it's going to work. And we get to be participants in that. Wednesday night, Pastor did such a beautiful job of ministering about the ministry model. And he's talking about the fifth one, about our purpose, about our role as mature children of God. And our purpose is to fulfill God's purpose in multiplying the message of God's Holy Spirit. And Pastor made a beautiful segue into this lesson when he talked about three different dispensations of time in the Bible. Now, dispensations are just periods of time. They're sliced up different ways depending upon what point you're trying to make. But Pastor talked about three distinct dispensations where God planned something and he commanded mankind to multiply. First, he talked about the Genesis account of God creating mankind in his own image and giving them dominion. And in Genesis chapter 1, God told them to multiply and to populate the earth. And by Genesis chapter 8, mankind had already so twisted God's purpose and intent, was so wicked in his sight, God decided he had to start all over. So the second dispensation pastor talked about was in Genesis 8, when God decided to use Noah the righteous and his family. And they again were to multiply and physically repopulate the earth. And then the third dispensation began with the unfilling of God's spirit into mankind after Calvary at Pentecost. Matthew 28, 16 through 20 is that familiar passage where Jesus told his disciples, I have all power and I'm commissioning you to go out into all the world and to share this gospel. And that dispensation, the one that we're still living in, isn't about multiplying physically. It's about multiplying spiritually. And Pastor did such a beautiful job of bringing that together. But God wasn't just going to be a God who's on the outside, that man could please through sacrifices. But he wanted to live inside of mankind. He wanted to empower them. He recognized with events my frailty, my weakness, mankind's. He had seen their failings in the previous two dispensations of time. He said, you know what? They can't do it on their own. They never could, really. They had to have the sacrifice. But now he was coming to live inside of them. So it's no longer for the Keith Adkins just righteous demeanor that's going to get him through life. It's going to be the power of the Holy Ghost working through a submitted life that says, I could, if of my own free will, push the Holy Ghost aside and do my own sinful thing if I choose. But I have the option to say, Lord, I submit my will unto you. I die daily and I allow the anointing of the Holy Ghost to work through me. And then I can live the way God wants. And that's the way God intended it all along, was us to be in pleasing fellowship with, man, with him. So somewhere along the way, Believers began to lose their faith and the grasp of the truth. And Wednesday, Pastor mentioned the spiritual awakening and the revival that began to stir as godly men and women began to seek after God in the early 1900s. There's some pictures there of the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles. I'm sure you've read about. Yet as recent as 50 years ago, some of the major Christian denominations in North America thought that speaking in tongues was, quote, literally, of the devil. They fought and they resisted this movement toward receiving the Holy Ghost. But we've had now more than 100 years of God-inspired Pentecost revival, and it's greatly affected society. Many sincere people now recognize, and today there's multitudes of various denominations whose members recognize the Holy Ghost, the power of it, and acknowledge the necessity of it as a fundamental tenet of their assemblies. 
I recognize that some of them need further illumination into the scripture regarding various aspects of the new birth experience. But God is working on many congregations, many different folks, bringing believers to lead and to guide them into all truth. John 16, 13 says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. And I believe if churches, if individuals, if I will seek after God and ask for him, he will lead me continually into more truth so I can please him continually more and more. But we have an opportunity to be a part of spiritual renewal. We can assist believers in discovering more about God that he has in store through them through the Holy Ghost. And that's my prayer, really, is that this church would be a beacon, not just to those who come here, but there's other churches all throughout it. We had an opportunity to go and be in service with a a neighboring Pentecostal church just a couple of months ago and talked about that the Holy Ghost is the same there as he is here, and there's no one church that's going to be able to contain end-time revival. God wants to reach the whole world, brothers and sisters. Other churches are going to have to recognize, here's the truth of God's word, the power that comes to the Holy Ghost, and we should certainly be right in the middle of that because... We're teaching every bit of the truth that we know, and it is the word of God. It's not what pastor believes. It's not what an elder board believes. The word of God, simply. Just preach that, teach that, obey that. What a blessing and an opportunity we have to know God intimately through this new birth. At the death of Jesus on the cross, that great veil in the temple that once separated the holiest of holies was supernaturally torn in two from the top to the bottom. It symbolized that God had made a way for all mankind to enter into the presence of God themselves. They don't have to go to a priest. I don't have to go to somebody else and ask them to be an emissary for me. I myself now have this opportunity. And this wasn't our idea. This wasn't the priest's idea. This was God's idea. This was his purpose in coming through Jesus Christ was to make that way between us and God. And the Holy Ghost is that avenue that we have to gain that. Every person can come to God for himself and enjoy a personal encounter with God, resulting in new spiritual birth and the beginning of a spiritual life in Jesus Christ. So as we look at the scriptures today, the Holy Spirit is essential, number one, for salvation. Now, some believe that receiving the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance is an additional spiritual empowerment for Christians. But they may not believe that it's necessary for salvation. But this is contrary to the teaching of the Scripture. The Scriptures clearly show the essentiality of the Spirit within the life of every true believer. Let's start in Romans chapter 8, verse 8 through 9. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That's strong language. He is none of his. Whenever Nicodemus came to Jesus, he asked him specifically, all of this teaching, Jesus, I'm not understanding. I'm hearing from your disciples. I must not be understanding it because they're teaching there has to be a new birth. What in the world can that mean? And Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. But thou canst not tell when it cometh and whether it goeth. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit. He's talking of water baptism and of the infilling of the Holy Ghost, that gift, that mighty rushing wind that came in whenever it was first poured out in Acts. We'll read of in just a moment. But he's, he's this last part here, you don't understand where it's coming through. Nicodemus was a very scholarly man, and Jesus is letting him know, you're not going to understand all of salvation. Nicodemus, you're not going to be able to give this formula and all of a sudden you've achieved it. There is going to be an anointing that comes and you're going to recognize that there's going to be a response. There's going to be a water baptism and there's going to be a birth of the Spirit and you are going to know. You're going to have to experience it. There's not going to be any doubt once that experience happens, Nicodemus. You're not going to be able to explain it mathematically. You're going to actually live it. You're going to experience it, be able to testify of it. Acts chapter 2, verse 2, tells of the Holy Spirit moving into that upper room as of a mighty rushing wind. You can't tell where it comes, but boy, you know whenever it's there. There's a moving, there's a movement that happened. Scripture talks about cloven tongues of fire set upon them. And of course, this caused a big stir because this is something new. This is something phenomenal. It never happened this way. The Jewish people always followed a prescribed formula for forgiveness or for pushing forward of sins, right? And yet here are these disciples speaking in tongues publicly out in front of them. They're coming asking. And Peter stands up and you know the the documentary through the book of Acts 
where Peter gives a wonderful witness, wonderful testimony, wonderful preaching. And then they ask him, how must we be saved in Acts 2.38? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and to your children, to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So instead of folks asking, do I have to receive the Holy Ghost to be saved? I think the logical question is, how can I receive the Holy Ghost? What is going to be that evidence? What can I do to receive this gift that God is wanting to give? Because receiving the gift of God, it's a distinct spiritual experience. It's part of the new birth. But every biblical account of the individuals receiving the Spirit was accompanied by a dramatic conversion. You don't receive something as powerful and anointing as the Holy Ghost and remain the same person. How many of you have seen that in a life? Experience it yourself. But if you grew up to the church, you don't see that same change. Oh, I've seen phenomenal change, though, in folks who have experienced life without God, and now they step into the anointing of the Holy Ghost. It is life transforming. It's beautiful to see. A study of the birth of the church at Pentecost and the expansion of the church throughout the book of Acts confirms the gift of the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues. When the Jews first received the Spirit, they spoke with tongues acts 2 and 4 the verse we've already been looking at up here when the samaritans first received the spirit they evidently spoke with tongues this is in acts chapter 8 now the scripture doesn't specifically mention tongues here but there was clearly a visible supernatural sign of these people receiving the spirit because when simon the sorcerer saw what happened he was willing to pay money to receive that same power so there had to be something some sign it wasn't just this internal acknowledgement he saw some sign something visible whoa I'm willing to give you money if you will teach me how to do this. And, of course, that isn't the way that God ends up working, but it does lend credence to the fact that they received the Holy Ghost with speaking in tongues there. He wanted to be able to replicate that. Further, when the Gentiles first received the Spirit, they spoke with tongues also in Acts chapter 10 and verse 46. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. In addition, the Ephesian disciples of John the Baptist spoke in tongues when they received the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 19, verse 2 through 6. Peter, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they told him, you know, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Ghost. And at the bottom of that verse, when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them. They spake with tongues and they prophesied. The Holy Ghost is essential for salvation. I think the scriptures clearly bear that out. But the Holy Ghost is also essential for service. Acts chapter 1 and 8 says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria unto the uttermost part of the earth. Not only did the Holy Ghost bring spiritual regeneration to the believers, it empowered them for Christian service. From the beginning in the garden, God desired that communion and that fellowship with mankind. He, he became a pathway of redemption whenever it was necessary to get back in alignment with God's plan. So one of God's primary desires and purposes for mankind is that we would reach out through evangelism to a lost world. Living for God, it's not just a statement. It's truly what would God do if he was here? How would he minister around 3510 West Malone? How would he minister around my neighborhood? How would he minister on my job? You know what? Somehow he's placed me in all three of those locations. I don't think it's happened since. I think he's given me the Holy Ghost for a purpose. He's given you the Holy Ghost for a purpose to share that anointing with other folks. If we give ourselves to prayer and the study of the word, the spirit will prompt us, it will lead us, it will guide us as a teacher. John 14, 26 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have told you. Is it important for believers to be led by the spirit in their Christian life? Well, absolutely. Paul indicated it as a qualifying definition of being born again. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The Holy Spirit will enlighten us. It gives us opportunities for ministry. As we continue to grow in spiritual ministry, spiritual maturity, by the Holy Ghost prompting and guidance, we'll also grow as servants of Christ. I think a common misconception among Christians is that it's the pastor's job. It's the minister's job. It's the care minister's job to end up being a service to be a minister. But rather... Every believer is meant to be a minister. It's always been pastor's statement. A minister is a servant, somebody who is willing to help other people out. And if you have that heart that is like Christ, you already have a servant's heart. You already have a minister's heart. 
you just don't have that expectation. It's only pastor. Go out expecting God's going to use me. God's going to bless me to be an anointing. We're called to occupy a specific place in the body of Christ as we minister to each other and we reach out to lead others to Christ. As we grow, as we serve the Lord in his church, a couple of things happen. Number one, the spirit will guide us with regard to timing as to when we're supposed to go into ministry. Sometimes it's immediate. We never knew folks come into the church and they receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost. There's a power that goes with them. And frequently they will bring many other souls to Christ right off the bat. But there's also an opportunity for you to grow, to begin discipling yourself, to start studying the Word of God so that you can share it more effectively. And secondly, the Spirit guides us as to where we're to go and who we're to minister to outside. He gives us direction. And it's not like, for the Wayne Adams, I want you to go do X, Y, or Z. Sometimes it's just a feeling, a nudge, and you'll notice afterwards. If you do it, oh, God was in it. That had such a great outcome. And sometimes you'll notice if you don't do it afterwards, you'll feel such a spirit of lost opportunity. <laughs> if I would have just had the faith to step out. Last Sunday, um, at, at the end of service, and there's an altar call in a Pentecostal church, and people are coming forward. I don't want to just go and talk with people, pray with people. Sometimes I will just join in blessing with, you know, a brother. Lay a hand on the Lord, ask your anointing upon him. But I do ask the Lord, Lord, is there something specific that you want me to say to anyone here? And think about that, pray about it. Sometimes I'll feel something, sometimes I don't. But last Sunday, I just felt the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Sister Joyce, she was sitting right where you're at. Sister Candace DePinto just had back surgery. And I was think, didn't see her. I saw her early in the service, knew where she was at. But as I was praying, she came to my mind. I just felt the love of the Lord for her. I thought, I want to go pray with her. Had a, had a thought that just hit my mind instantly while she's recovering. And God's going to take this time of rest. And not just to help her physically. He's going to be a blessing to her spiritually. She's going to have a wonderful time as she goes to this recovery, drawing close to God. And great thought, I thought. I was glad to go share it with her. And if I opened my eyes to move, she was surrounded by her children. She was sitting down. And it's like, have you ever prayed with somebody? You knew you had a good thought or a mind from God, and yet it wasn't the right time, and you pushed it. I've done that multiple times. Well, the Lord gave me that idea with the clouds. I'm just going to go pray for me. It don't always work out so well. You've got to follow that timing as well. And I look away, and I was disappointed, I'll have to tell you. I was expecting the Lord to do something, and She's all surrounded. There's no way she's going to be able to receive this. So I prayed with other people. And I started to walk back up, and I looked, and right beside with the Lord, she was standing in the middle of the aisle with her hands up. Oh, my face broke out into a smile. But I know she's ready to receive right now. Whenever you allow the Spirit to guide you, it won't always be, but the Keith Adkins, go do this. It'll just be that nudge, that feeling of, oh, I should do this. You know what? If it's for good, step out in faith. Satan's not going to be telling you, go pray for Sister Candace DePinto. Step out believing God's going to anoint you. You're ministers. You've been filled with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Let that Holy Ghost work in you. The Holy Ghost will empower us to live a Christian life. The power that comes from the Holy Ghost not only empowers us as witnesses, but it enables us to connect with God in daily relationship and spiritual life. The Holy Spirit within is our spiritual lifeline. Now, our day is one of unprecedented allurements of the world and temptations of the flesh. I don't think there's any different ones. I think there's always been the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. But today's multimedia culture with computers and you got your smartphones, everybody has their own temptations specifically right there at their fingertips. And Satan knows it. So surrounded by such an overwhelming draw of potential temptations there if you allow it, it's essential for us as believers to have a daily relationship with Jesus Christ. To daily wash, Lord, wash my mind. Help me put on the... the armor of the Holy Spirit, anoint my mind, anoint my spirit, give me that shield of faith, give me the word of the Lord that I can effectively go through life today. The Holy Spirit will empower us to preach with power, and this isn't for ministers, this isn't for preachers unless you're going to use it the right way, because the Greek word translated preach in the New Testament is not exclusive just to those who carry license, rather the fundamental idea is to preach or proclaim the gospel it applies to all believers who want to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. He has called all Christians to share their faith, to proclaim to others the goodness of the Lord and the life-saving power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I missed somewhere in here a point that I wanted to make about anointing that comes through testimony. How many of you have heard a testimony from somebody and you felt the moving of the Holy Ghost as they was talking? That is what you want to end up having. And just a couple I wanted to mention because it just happened was Brother Steve and Sister Tanya Carter. I love being around them. 
right? We went, we went out to lunch a couple of weeks ago after a service, and I was expecting it to be a, a, a wonderful time because they testify of things that God has done. And it isn't just their words, because testimonies work, right? They work in a courthouse. Whenever I tell a moving story at work, they end up responding. Stories work. A witness works. Whenever there's a power of the Holy Ghost that's behind that, there is such an anointing that flows. And I could feel the Holy Ghost working. Nicholas came home from one of the Sunday school classes talking about a testimony Sister Tanya gave. There's an anointing that happens. Be talking about spiritual things. Allow your testimony, your witness to go forth because it isn't just your words that are at work. The Holy Ghost is going to work through your words and through your spirit to be a blessing to other people. Let me see where I'm at. The scriptures reveal the inherent power of the word of God. Isaiah recorded God's assurance in Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. When anyone shares God's word, there's power that accompanies that. So there's encouragement when we're alone. John 14, 16 through 18, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. God is talking here. Jason, whenever you're going through difficult times, you don't understand why it's going this way. You're not alone. I will be with you. The Holy Comforter, the Holy Ghost, that I took all this time and all this preparation, I lined up scripture and precept upon precept to make this come to fruition, to live inside of you. I will be there for you. Jesus gave his disciples and all Christians one of the greatest promises they were ever to receive whenever he gave us the promise of the Father. Little could the disciples have realized how great a promise it was. That promise of the Father was simply that assurance that the Lord would send the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, and it would indwell everyone who would receive him. The foundation of Pentecost rests in the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, which established the church on the day of Pentecost. And from that day until now, genuine believers everywhere have been blessed to experience the power of redemption through the Holy Spirit. It changes your life. It enhances your life. It's the heart of receiving and living a new life in Christ Jesus. This is the experience that was prophesied of back in the Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19 through 20. And I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and I will give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Way back in the Old Testament, God was already planning what he was going to do for us. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. I'm so glad that God came to live with us and then offered himself as the Holy Ghost to live inside of us. God knows right where you're at, brothers and sisters. How many of you have a GPS unit or have ever seen one? Technology still amazes me. I use computers. I use GPS. It's just amazing how they work. I can't understand them. I just plug it in and, and go with it. But it's just amazing how accurate that they are. But as amazing as GPS is, there's a system, a power. There's an anointing that's so much better than GPS. It's the awesome plan of God to come and to live inside of every man right where you're at. Everybody who will submit their life into his care. There's an option I have to make. I have to make that choice. Lord, I receive you. I'm willing to live in accordance with your word. But as we've studied today, the Holy Spirit is essential. And it's God's mechanism for us to be saved to be enlightened in the scriptures, to be empowered for Christian service, and then to be encouraged for every circumstance in life. You know, whenever you turn on that GPS, there's 24 satellites that circle around the globe continuously in certain orbits. They make two laps every day. And as long as you can get that GPS to lock on to three of them, that GPS knows exactly where you're at within a matter of feet. Here it's getting better sometimes. I, don't know, I won't go out into wild theories, but... Right now, you get three GPS locks from satellites. It knows exactly where you're at. And then what does it do? It asks you one question. Where do you want to go? You know what? God knows exactly where you're at, brothers and sisters. He's given us free will, though. We can choose what we want to do with our life, and he's asking us, where, Jason, do you want to go? I've given you this power. I've given you this anointing. Phenomenal. That God who created everything designed before life, here's the one thing that I want every person to have is the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
and yet I have it, and what am I doing with it? Brothers and sisters, he's given us the vehicle. Make sure we're full of the gas, of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Then let's go where God wants us to go. It's revival. It's excelling. It's, it's a beautiful future. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do because I go to my Father. How many of you want better gifts for your children than you had growing up? Jesus said the same thing, greater work. And he did phenomenal things. Everywhere that he went, people were healed. They were saved. They were redeemed. Greater works than these shall you do. Amen. Let's stand and ask God's anointing upon us. Thank him for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Help us to recognize the power that is within us and help us to put it into action. Jesus, I thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost that you've given us. Thank you for the truth of your word. I ask you to take away the scales of apathy, the blinders that Satan and sin would bring into our lives and blind us to the power that we have in you, the power of the Holy Ghost. God, I ask you to help us to... Bring that to the fruition. Help us to grow that, to let the anointing of the Holy Ghost work in us. Help us to draw closer to you daily. I ask you to lead and guide and direct us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. We give you praise and thanks for it. Ask your anointing upon our time of fellowship and upon the refreshments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you.